Hi, everyone, and welcome to the NCAT webinar, Payments for Ecosystem Services Part 3, Water Quality Trading. My name is Colin Mitchell. I am a Sustainable Agriculture Specialist at the National Center for Property Technology, which is kind of a mouthful, so most people just know us as NCAT. On today's webinar, we have two very special guest presenters, Mark Kaiser, who is a senior scientist at Kaiser & Associates, and Brian Brandt, the Agriculture Conservation Innovations Director at American Farmland Trust. So I work out of our Southwest office in San Antonio, Texas. NCAT is a nationwide nonprofit organization established in 1976 that has six regional offices across the country. In Arkansas, Mississippi, California, New Hampshire, and Texas with our headquarters in Montana. Also, we have some staff in other states such as Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Colorado. And we work on issues pertaining to sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy, and sustainable communities. So I want to give a thank you to NCAT, ATRA, and our IT staff at NCAT for making this all possible. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCAT's ATRA webpage and on our YouTube channel. ATRA, our sustainable agriculture program, is funded through a cooperative agreement with the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service, and we're grateful for their support as well. So ATRA offers a wide range of services to sustainable agriculture producers, including publications, toll-free helplines, and webinars like this one. You can check it out for yourself after the webinar on the ATRA website, www.atra.incat.org. If you have technical questions, don't ever hesitate to call us at 1-800-346-9140 or shoot us an email at askandag at incat.org. So there's a couple of other things I'd like to point out before we get started. First, you'll see a question field on the screen where you can write questions during the webinar. We will be collecting the questions and we will answer a number of them towards the end of the webinar. Do not be shy about asking questions. If you ask a question and it is not answered during the webinar, we will answer it and all the questions we get via email in the days to come. In fact, if you think of questions after the webinar or about any sustainable agriculture question, Look for the Ask an Ag Expert contact information on the ATRA website or take down the number in the email at the bottom of your screen. Also, at the end of the webinar, you will receive a short survey. Please take a few minutes to answer the survey. It helps us make future webinars as effective and helpful as we can. So I wanted to give a special thanks to Dr. Barbara Bellows of Tarleton State's Texas Institute of Applied Environmental Research and Southern Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, often known as Southern SARE. This webinar series, and this is the third and final part, is part of a Southern SARE funded research and education grant in collaboration with Dr. Bellows and the Texas Institute of Applied Environmental Research. And now on to proper introductions for our guest speakers. Mark Kaiser is a senior scientist and principal at Kaiser & Associates LLC, an environmental science and engineering firm that investigates and applies creative solutions for environmental problems. Mark is a specialist in water quality trading, part program and policy development with 25 years of US and international experience. He has examined trading in 28 states and is now working on unique variations of market-based approaches for water quality trading investments, particularly in the agricultural center. Brian Brandt is the Agriculture Conservation Innovations Director at American Farmland Trust, or AFT for short. And Brian plays a principal role in AFT's efforts to engage the agricultural industry in developing environmental service markets in the Ohio River Basin and the Upper Midwest. Working with partners in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana, Brian led AFT's effort to develop the first multiple credit ecosystem services market in the country. He has also participated in several national and state conservation innovation grant projects funded by the USDA. Brian is a part-time farmer and grew up on a hog and cash grain farm in Ohio. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Agronomy from the Ohio State University. So now I'm gonna pass it off to Mark and Mark, take it away. Thank you, Colin, much appreciated. Uh, welcome everybody to the seminar. It's certainly our pleasure to be here today to talk a little bit about some of the work that's been done in the US uh, over the last 20 plus years on this idea of water quality trading. And 
There are lots of definitions uh, for water quality trading. Uh, years ago, people used to call it pollution uh, trading. Uh, the idea was, is we're, we're dealing with water quality issues in the really the regulated sector uh, for the for the U.S. This is usually think wastewater treatment plants. These days, it's now municipalities and stormwater. The notion was early on, as these entities that are regulated, usually by state or federal permit, uh, start to get tighter and tighter limits, and uh, this is usually around phosphorus and nitrogen discharges, they began to face a number of really significant economic questions of, for the millions that they might invest in additional treatment, could there be a fraction of that cost spent somewhere else in a watershed uh, for uh, getting the same or even greater environmental benefit. And early on that notion was trading between wastewater tre treatment plants uh, where one could reduce uh, cheap more cheaply than another. And there was an exchange of reduction credits, if you will, between those entities and then it really kind of took on interest with trading between municipal wastewater treatment plants and agriculture. The notion being is that these wastewater treatment plants are facing diminishing uh, returns on those investments, lots of money for very little benefit. Could they take a portion of those intended expenditures and put those out in the landscape? Uh, particularly the environmental, uh, the agricultural setting uh, with conservation practices and get uh, equivalent or greater reductions at a fraction of cost. And that's really the some of the early origins of the conversation around water quality trading and agriculture. Now, in the U.S., uh, there's been a lot of activity here uh, since the late 1980s. Uh, EPA was looking at this notion of environmental markets uh, in the water sector following some of the air programs, the acid rain programs uh, that really looked to optima uh, optimize environmental improvements uh, with, with the funding that had to be expended by regulated entities. And so in the early uh, 1980s through the mid 1980s, there was some experimentation that was going on, some pilot trades across the US. Then in the, about the mid 1990s, there was a fair amount of activity that uh, came about funded by EPA, where there was a strong interest to uh, work with a, a number of other entities uh, those being states, industries, municipalities, certainly agriculture, uh, non-governmental organizations, and, and watershed stakeholders. The map here that you see as an inset, the where states are color-coded here, that indicates there's been some level of statewide interest uh, in these types of water quality trading programs. The individual uh, triangles you see here, these are a number, these certainly don't represent all, but a number of some of the larger pilot projects that in many cases initiated uh, interest at the state level to look at the types of uh, programs that could apply to their waters of the state. Now, in 2003, EPA realized that there was a real need to harmonize, if you will, some of the notions around water quality trading, establish some precepts or some expectations because these often involve regulated entities. And where a, a permitted entity, a regulated entity might engage in this kind of a, a program or contractual relationship with a farmer, uh, it was always voluntary on the part of the farmer's participation. And for the most part today, I'll speak about uh, the agricultural participant uh, in the context of some of the trading programs that we've seen unfolding. So in 2003, EPA laid down their initial policy that put forth the expectations that EPA had in terms of uh, that these types of exchanges had to be real. 
somebody had to actually make an improvement in the landscape uh, that was quantifiable, uh, that it was transparent, and it could be tracked. And the reason why there were some of the, the couple key concepts that were so important in tracking this information, uh, these reductions that were put in the landscape is because the permitted entities have substantial liability for meeting their requirements. And I think that has been probably one of the greatest challenges of working with a regulated entity that faces very severe daily penalties for failure to comply with their discharge limits when they're relying on somebody else that's external to their operation, somebody that's in the watershed that's also committed to putting in a conservation practice that's getting an equal or greater reduction in say phosphorus, re um, phosphorus reductions or nitrogen reductions. And so that I think has probably been one of the largest challenges in looking at these programs that wanted to focus in the, the agricultural setting, uh, how farmers and operators, producers could be generators of credits uh, by putting in conservation practices, and then how those uh, reductions that come from those practices could be used in a very regulated permit setting. And so it's been an interesting nexus over the years. And early on, the states were fairly reluctant to uh, consider these types of exchanges. Um, the states were pretty much hands off for the most part in the 1990s. Uh, they basically said, well, EPA's got an interesting idea here. If we're going to allow this, and many of the states were actually our regulators of those permits, uh, the states began to recognize that, look, if everybody wants to do this, uh, we, we should have some guidelines or some basis, standardized basis for which everybody has to operate in these water quality treatment programs. So you start, started to see a number of states that develop these programs. What's interesting on the map, and, and, and I speak from uh, this as being a, a Michigander, Michigan was the first state in the country to develop water quality treating rules. They were also notoriously the first state to uh, rescind those rules uh, when they didn't get used after uh, 10 to 15 years of being on the books. That was a challenge with uh, some of the early development of these programs is we had to be we almost in these regulations had to cover every possible scenario that someone might conceive of in terms of, hey, where could things go wrong? In that case, uh, the early rules were quite uh, burdensome and few people could use them. Now, just in a simple contrast, our neighbors to our Southeast in Ohio uh, took the approach of simplifying their rules and allowing the flexibility to come uh, on a watershed by watershed basis. Very consistent with how EPA looked at this is saying, hey, here's the high level considerations in these programs. Uh, you need to be addressing these things, but how you do it is up to you so long as you are addressing those. So Ohio then came up with uh, some very flexible rules uh, and then you saw a number of other states follow suit. One of the uh, early arguments for water quality trading was really this is just a license to pollute. And there was a lot of, of uh, skepticism to uh, put it lightly from some of the environmental groups that hey, this this is really an unacceptable exchange there are going to be these paper exchanges there's not going to really be an environmental benefit and that drove a lot of how the programs then became developed uh, over the years and interestingly enough uh, in the 2000s when the interest in water quality trading began to uh, take off a number of these programs, uh, a number of these states said, well, look, we do this on a watershed basis. And so, hey, the Ohio River Basin, which I think has 11 or 12 states in it, but there's there's kind of a core six or seven states. The Ohio River Basin said, well, we are all kind of in the same boat here. Why don't we have one ubiquitous trading program across all these states? Uh, my colleague and friend Brian Brandt will be speaking uh, about that project here in just a few minutes. The Chesapeake Bay was also kind of an, uh, one of the early participants in developing these programs. Uh, they had notions of doing multi-state trading. It kind of came down, hey, with state by state. 
they came up with their own rules. That became a challenge later on when Pennsylvania's rules were uh, not acceptable to Maryland. So even if it's a, a bi-state watershed, the trading across that magical political boundary uh, was often impeded because there were different different rules for different states. That has since worked out. There's some really interesting innovations that have cropped up in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, Western Lake, uh, Lake Erie Basin is uh, Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan contributing a lot of the, the phosphorus that's created a number of the algal bloom issues there. Uh, and so there's been uh, a tri-state agreement to trade across political boundaries there because everybody discharges into the bay. Another interesting, almost kind of an early bi-state program was in Lake Tahoe, uh, California, Nevada. Uh, this is now an agreement between municipalities that share these stormwater loading reduction requirements to exchange between each other. No farming involved in that one, but it was one of the early bi-state agreements. And, and just a kind of a sense of, of uh, who we are, we're, where we're at. We're actually now in about 29 states. We've been doing this for about 25 years, and, and uh, we've had the opportunity to be a part of a, a couple of textbooks on this. And so the, the, the notion of, of where we've been out there in the landscape and getting into different perspective is kind of illustrated here with just our circle. So uh, we just look at this as the um, kind of the uniqueness of each state setting. And what we've seen over the years is each state has basically recognized, look, we have our own challenges and we have our own ways of, of how we work at these challenges. And that has led to really a lot of flexibility, a lot of variation between these programs. Uh, and fundamentally for two decades, we were very, very finitely focused on this idea of a regulated entity who needs economic relief for their compliance would work with another discharger on a voluntary basis to make those reductions for them in this, this somewhat tight interpretation of a regulatory driven program. And I'll speak to that in just a second of how we see that changing. Well, this is just kind of a brief of what we see as the current state of trading in the US. Um, from the previous map, you, there's quite a bit of footprint out there where we, see growing interest is really kind of on a watershed by watershed basis. There are a number of other stakeholders that are seeing the, the value of investing in the, in, in the landscape or investing in uh, water quality improvements where you get the best return. And I think that's kind of the economic underpinning for this, this idea of trading is high cost for compliance. You seek out uh, low or the, the cheapest costs uh, through other source reductions. And so that's that's why we often call these kind of a market-based approach. These are market-driven by economics. In 2019, EPA uh, came out and, and had been reflecting on the 2003 trading policy and, and said, well, do we need to update this? And so there was, there was a recognition that there had been some impediments over the years that we had seen from the early 2003 uh, water quality trading policy to the present. And oftentimes those really affected agriculture. Um, it, it created a lot of issues uh, that we think are being addressed programmatically in terms of agricultural participation, uh, requirements for what has to be done in the ag agricultural landscape before somebody can generate a credit, uh, how long can those credits be used, and uh, I think there's been a lot of creativity that has come forth in these, these programs across the country to address a number of these. The 2019 uh, statement by EPA really recognized a lot of those innovations and how those prob problems had been addressed. And it was, um, I don't know that there was any formality to the statements that were made in 2019 other than to be kind of cheerleading uh, 16 years after the original policy to say this is good and there's been uh, innovations and we support those innovations. I think one of the, the challenges that we've seen over the years in the development of these programs is this recognition for early investments. These, uh, you, we might think of some of the um, 
the producers that are always out in front of the curve in terms of adoption. Uh, when these programs develop, the question comes up as well, we've been doing this for years and we've had these, you know, we've been generating these water quality benefits for years with the investments we've made in conservation practices over these years. Can we still get credits? One of the challenges with that is this notion of contemporaneous uh, benefits to the environment. Most of the permits, if you will, for the regulated side of this, the buyer side of the equation, usually are on an annual basis in terms of the reductions they have to make. And so for a water year, say the water year 2020, to be able to go back and say, if somebody did a, an improvement in the landscape in 2015, the, the time frame is not the same in terms of how that water quality benefit is being derived uh, at the time of the, the permit year. Now, we've seen some really great innovations on how we can go back and recognize some of those practices, even though you might not get uh, credit that you can bank for those past years. Uh, some of these programs are now starting to say is what you were doing three years ago. Uh, will it doesn't have to be a new practice. We'll recognize what you started a couple of years back and allow you to do year to year to year uh, crediting. Standardization has really kind of taken, it has been a slow process here in standardization of just about all aspects of these programs in terms of how do you calculate a benefit from a conservation practice to how do you uh, create a verification program that says practices are still in the landscape and operating. Um, there's a whole host of protocols that have been developed over the years. And just recently, in these last five years, we're starting to see kind of a standardization of what those really are. Uh, USDA has been a very, very strong supporter of water quality trading programs over the years and has really complemented uh, these efforts through their conservation innovation grants, as well as through their, their modeling efforts through the nutrient tracking tool, for example. Well, kind of coming to some of our, our final thinking here is, you know, where are we at now? I, we have to be honest here is most of these water quality trading markets, especially for agricultural participation, are quite thin. There hasn't been the, the regulatory driver on the buyer side to really push a lot of this need for uh, lower cost reduction credits from the agricultural sector. And therefore, these we call these fairly thin. What we have seen is a very uh, exciting evolution from this traditional notion of this is an alternative compliance program for say wastewater treatment plants to saying, hey, how do we begin to build in these concepts of accountability, of conservation, of benefits tracking, of benefits quantification into some of our supply chain and sustainability programs. And, and there are really some, uh, there are many exciting opportunities out there. One of them happens to be this ecosystem services market consortium, uh, where a lot of the actions that are being driven in the landscape are related to A, soil health, and B, uh, other mechanisms, payment mechanisms to farmers and uh, producers other than this wastewater treatment plant that may be for a local municipality. Well, some of the recent developments, and, and I'll, I'll begin to wrap up some of my comments here, is, is what we just saw on the previous screen is this recognition of the, the different environmental benefits that will come from uh, work in the ag landscape of carbon, water quality, water quantity. Uh, Wisconsin is really bec uh, becoming, if you will, maybe a, uh, a large hotbed for this market-based application, not only through the water quality trading, that's the WQT acronym, but they have it's adaptive management and variances for all of the municipal wastewater treatment plants and industrial plants that are basically looking for these types of inexpensive uh, reduction credits in the ag landscape. Uh, Ohio is, uh, always has had trading rules on the books for a number of years, not used very frequently, but Brian will talk about some of the innovations that are now starting to come forth in, in Ohio around drinking water protection, and nitrates and groundwater nitrates. Uh, Brian will also spend, has a number of slides in the Ohio River Basin program. This is one of the uh, 
it was forecasted to be the largest multi-state trading program in the world. The problem just has been is that the regulatory drivers never manifested. And so there hasn't been a lot of trading or even the voluntary crediting system that we sometimes we see around these stewardship credits. Uh, we did an assessment in this project, uh, gosh, well over a decade ago, and we thought uh, with the, the over 7,000 wastewater treatment plants in the Ohio River Basin through these multiple states that were all kind of operating at 50 year old treatment technology, states were saying, look, we've got to develop water quality standards. That's going to force lots of money for uh, compliance. There could, could have been over $2 billion worth of money flowing into agriculture at that time through these programs. The states just never came forward and really finalized those drivers. So uh, Ohio has been an interesting setting of the river basin. Iowa has recently uh, kind of pushed into this, this uh, trading landscape in these market-based approaches. Uh, with the nutrient reduction exchange and there's actually active municipal investments in upstream agriculture and the municipalities are saying well we have our nutrient compliance requirements that we have to meet but we also know that if we uh, start restoring some of the hydrology in the agricultural landscape that's a benefit to us in terms of flood mitigation so there's a lot of interest there missouri is missouri is just taking off on on uh, water quality trading guidance that they had a couple of years ago in uh, looking at a number of watersheds, how do you engage ag? And then I mentioned the, uh, the Western Lake Erie Basin. And one of the significant issues that's coming up, we see this often now in the headlines are harmful algal blooms, these blue-green algal blooms. This is Lake Erie and you see the Western Basin, kind of this greenish. A lot of that is related to soluble phosphorus. A lot of that soluble phosphorus is coming from the agricultural landscape, especially tiled areas. So there's there's a real interest in saying, well, how do we use these programs to help us get to these, these endpoints? Well, as Brian will lay out, and I won't spend much time here, is there, there's a number of uh, considerations that farmers will have to look at when they consider participating in these programs is really, you know, if, if we're putting in practices you know, somebody's going to pay us for the calculated benefits, but what are we losing in the exchange? Uh, there's always some form of contractual liability, and, and oftentimes what we said is, well, look, if you can uh, get in a farm bill program, an equip program, the contracting that's here with these trading programs, we can make it easier uh, than what you do with that. Um, opportunity, you know, the markets are fairly spotty right now and there are a lot of promises made with some of these early programs and, you know, broken promises lead to disappointment, lead to disengagement, and that's been a challenge. Um, there are some participation uh, limitations that have been out there. Is the baseline is what do I have to do on the landscape before I can do one more practice that just gives me enough credits to get into the program that kind of falls in with eligibility. And I think one of the, the final comments that I would leave with you in terms of consideration is we've kind of gone from this early mentality of saying, hey, we'll pay you, you know, the farming community to do something, put a conservation practice into the ground. We don't care what it is. We don't care if it helps your operation. We'll pay you to do it. But from the farmer side is it's not really looking at has this really helped our operation? I think the move to the focus on soil health practices versus conservation practices is really key because soil health, a focus on soil health really helps get the farmer looking at, you know, those critical issues around long-term sustainability of their operations. And that really connects uh, more appropriately with a lot of these programs. So with that, um, uh, you know, USDA we know is is focusing on soil health, that ecosystem service markets that consortium really developed out of the notion of soil health, and uh, we certainly think that's the future here. So with that, Colin, I'll I'll uh, I'll go on mute, and uh, you can turn it over to Brian, and you can take off from there. Thank you. All righty, thank you so much, Mark and Brian. It is your turn. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Colin. And also thank you to Mark for a great introduction um, for, for really giving an, an overview of water quality trading um, over the past couple of decades and, and kind of those next things that are on the horizon. 
Um, so the first couple of slides here, um, well, to start off, I'm going to give a little bit of overview on the Ohio River Basin Trading Project, um, just some of the considerations um, and the impetus for developing that program, um, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, the, the processes and protocols that are involved with that, you know, the experience that we, we have had and, and what we're able to accomplish really over the the first phase of that pilot program uh, where we're, we were able uh, to um, fund uh, some ag conservation practices on the ground, and then how that's leading into some new work that's taking place in central Ohio. Um, so one thing I do want to point out here, and I'm going to go back to the opening slide, um, we were a principal partner on the Ohio River Basin Project with the Electric Power Research Institute, Jessica Fox with EPRI was the lead on that project. So we were a principal partner and really coordinated the on the ground activity with that particular project. Um, and, you know, working with farmers and local soil and water conservation districts and so forth to actually, to actually implement that project. Um, but to first couple of slides here, I really want to recap one or two items that, that Mark pointed out. You know, we know within a watershed uh, that that pollutant sources, and I'm talking about nitrogen and phosphorus that, that Mark was referring to as well, really come from a lot of sources. You know, we have um, both point sources, um, whether it's a wastewater treatment plant or a power plant or other industrial sources that are regulated under the Clean Water Act. And then you have non-point sources as well. Uh, so that can come from, know, agricultural lands, other private lands. Um, it can be, um, um, you know, a, a, a treatment system uh, at a, an indiv individual home. Um, and, and all those kind of are those non-point sources that, that really aren't regulated under the Clean Water Act. Um, so, so we need to recognize there's a, a, an influx of nutrient sources from, from many so different sources in the watershed. <clears throat> and I'm pausing here because, again, or, or my my slide is not advancing. Try clicking in one more time, Brian. See if that okay. does. If not, I can change it for you. And Brian, if you click your mouse right on the slide directly to. Yeah, I'm, I've done that multiple times, and I'm just not getting it to having it advance. Okay, um, I'll, I'll take over. Okay, and I'll, I'll just let you know when to advance. Okay. So, again, as Mark mentioned, um, you know, the, the idea of water quality trading and, and what we were trying to accomplish in the Ohio River Basin Trading Program is to facilitate trades uh, between a permitted source um, that may have high treatment cost and um, farms or, or sources from agriculture, non-point sources um, that, that typically would be unregulated. Um, and uh, point sources could pay farmers to implement practices um, at the ground level on the farm that generate credits that then the point source could essentially um, used to meet their permit requirements under their um, NPDES permit, their Clean Water Act permit. Um, and so hopefully, you know, these overall water quality improvements, um, you know, would be met um, in the watershed, but at a much lower cost than if we were just to, to upgrade, um, you know, the point where the, the point source would be treating it. Um, can you go back one, Colin? Yes, uh, that was not me. That was interesting. Um, and go back another one. Another one. Uh, keep really, keep going really back a little bit more. Yes. Um, so one of the great things about water quality trading that I would like to point out is, is when you actually have a functioning and viable water quality trading market, um, as opposed to just upgrading, uh, you know, at a point source where you get the benefit, you know, at that point source and beyond when you make investments uh, up in the watershed 
uh, at the farm level with farmers, you get many other ancillary benefits uh, that you don't necessarily get when you're just treating, you know, the source uh, at, at a particular point. So like Mark mentioned, you know, we get healthier soils, we can get carbon sequestration that address climate change, we can get improved um, biodiversity and habitat for pollinators and other species. Um, and we, you know, um, and, and we're supporting local communities because we have additional money flowing into those communities that supports um, farmers and, and the kind of those other complementary businesses that support farmers in, in those local communities. So we do get many other ancillary benefits. Next slide, please. Um, and I also want to recognize that water quality trading really occurs in the context of many other things that address water quality. Uh, so we have, you know, many other Clean Water Act um, programs and opportunities, farm bill programs, um, whether it's through through NRCS or, or other farm bill programs. And then, you know, state and counties have their own programs that address water quality as well. Next slide. Um, and and giving an overall uh, overview of the Ohio River Basin, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, the program was developed in the watershed is because, you know, there's a potential uh, large demand and a large supply of credits within the watershed. So uh, Mark already mentioned thousands of wastewater treatment plants, 46 power plants, 230,000 farmers. Um, you know, so there was a lot of opportunity to both uh, generate credits and uh, potential demand for those credits. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, real quickly, the, the project ob objectives and approach, the overall objectives was you know, to test uh, the, the potential to have an interstate water, qual water quality trading program, you know, work together with multiple states to implement that. Um, so it would be an example of how um, kind of multiple jurisdic jurisdictions could work together to implement a water quality trading program. Um, and we were focused on reducing the overall loading of nutrients within the Ohio River Basin, you know, using a trading program. And, you know, again, collaboration, really utilizing strong science as the basis for, for calculating credits, you know, having defensible rules uh, that could be you know, potentially replicable um, to other locations. And again, getting those ancillary benefits. And really the driver in, in this particular program was uh, through power plants um, that were looking at uh, limits on future nitrogen inputs or emissions from power plants into the main stem of the Ohio River Basin. You know, thinking about numeric nutrient criteria uh, that would be coming online and, and would reduce the amount of nitrogen that, that they could admit. Uh, as Mark mentioned, those re regulatory drivers never really came about. Um, so again, uh, didn't lead to drivers for trading in general, but, th but that was the impetus for trading to occur in the watershed. Next slide. And, and you know, really relies on a lot of collaborators. Um, so many organizations were involved in the development of the program. Uh, we really had to have input from the states because they had to sign off on the, the trading program and protocols. So Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky, and working with the state departments of ag and the state uh, environmental protection agency in each of those states. Um, relied the, the input of federal agencies and many environmental stakeholders as well. Next slide. And, and we really relied on the input from multiple um, stakeholders within the watershed. So. Uh, AFT itself oversaw uh, input from an agricultural stakeholder committee, uh, but we had multiple stakeholders and, and groups of entities and organizations that provided input throughout the process. And I think it was important to have that input so so that you know we we ended up with a viable uh, trading program that not only worked for agriculture but 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 for the point sources as well as 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 we envisioned uh, the drivers uh, would be developing. Next slide. Um, so ultimately, if we go back to 2012, that's when our trading progr program um, was originally approved. Um, those details really needed to cover multiple aspects here. So 
they needed to address, you know, having consistency and rigor in, in many aspects. Um, it needed to provide details on the watershed model and, and how we calculated um, the credits that were being produced and, 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 and were being transacted. It needed to identify the baselines, in other words, when farmers were eligible to participate. Uh, it established reserve and insurance pools of credits, um, incentives for early buyers, and you know it allowed us to adaptively manage the trading program over time. And, and just in, in relation to that, to that idea, we have amended the trading program twice since 2012. And then also detailed the verification and monitoring activities that really needed to take place to ensure that we actually um, practices were implemented and, and credits or reductions were real. Next slide. Um, so as a part of that uh, protocol and document documentation process from the credit creation side or, or really the, the the farmer side of things, you know, when a farmer implements a practice, we had an installation certification. Uh, we have yearly verifications and the departments and environmental protection certified those credits yearly. Um, and then from the transaction side, uh, we also had documentation to make sure that as a buyer would be purchasing credits, that, that those credits would be transferred to that buyer and could be recognized from the permit side of things. Um, and just the guiding principles here is, you know, make sure we can enforce the trading plan, have a, uh, those, uh, you know, assurances be legally robust, um, have simple contracts and and guidelines for trading to occur, and, and overall protects the program integrity. Next slide. Um, really want to talk about this idea of baselines. Um, Within our program, we we really um, decided uh, from a policy perspective to have a, a, a minimal eligibility requirement. Uh, so essentially, for farmers to be eligible, they had to be implementing a new um, or additional practice to their operation. They they couldn't generate uh, credits for something that they were already doing. It had, definitely had to be a new practice. And as long as they were meeting either local or state uh, regulatory guidelines in relationship to their farming operation, as long as they were implementing a new practice, they were eligible to create credits in our program. Um, and, and just some of the examples of best management practices, exclusion fencing, nutrient management, cover crops, buffer strips, heavy use pads, manure pits. Next slide. Um, and, and we actually had uh, transactions and practices implemented in, in a couple of different areas. So really uh, East Central Ohio and then the Tri-County area um, down uh, in Southern Ohio, Northern Kentucky and Southeast Indiana were the, were the two primary areas. We had over 30 farmer contracts, um, recognized 66,000 pounds of N reductions and 30,000 pounds of P reductions. Next slide. Um, so there we just have a graphic of what does what 66,000 pounds look like? You know, that's, that's if you were looked at bag fertilizer, that's what it looks like. Next slide. Um, in the counties, again, um, we had five counties in Kentucky or six counties in Kentucky, four counties in Ohio, and four counties in Indiana. Um, and I already talked a little bit about the BMPs. Next slide. Um, and then I just wanted to point out individually within within the three states, um, we had over 25,000 pounds of nitrogen reductions and nearly 9,000 pounds of phosphorus reductions in Indiana, uh, over 26,000 pounds of nitrogen reductions and, and again, nearly 9,000 pounds of phosphorus reductions in Ohio. Um, and then nearly 40,000 pounds of nitrogen reductions, and again, about 9,000 pounds of phosphorus reductions in, in Kentucky. Um, and, and these are five to 10 year contracts. So the farmer had a commitment to, to implement and keep those practices operational um, for the term of the contract. And again, those contracts were either five or 10 years. Next slide. Um, and when we evaluated um, the projects that the farmers proposed, 
our primary evaluation criteria was what was the cost per pound of end reduction? So we wanted to be as efficient as possible in, in how we were investing the dollars. And so, you know, what was the cost per pound of, of achieving those nutrient reductions, primarily nitrogen reductions? But we also evaluated, you know, a couple other parameters. You know, we wanted a range of practices to gain maximum knowledge. You know, we wanted to be able to address any local um, or state priority concerns. And again, you know, look at the other ancillary benefits that would be provided by doing the by doing the projects. And and also we look at outreach potential. Um, we did a series of videos with several farmers uh, to highlight the work done and the benefits that that were gained from those. Um, and then you know, if if we calculate the the pounds per um, uh, pounds per nitrogen uh, dollars per pound of nitrogen produced, we were generally in that. Two to three dollars per pound of nitrogen reduction range, um, which compares favorably with you know many other incentive or or um, other programs that that incentivize um, farmers adopting nutrient practices. Next slide. Uh, and this is just an a, a example of a before and after picture of one of our projects just to show that you know that you really do get real benefits uh, reduces runoff sedimentation things like that um, and it solves the problem for the farmer and it's you know it can be very healthy for animals this was a heavy use area here so there's a lot of benefits related to implementing those practices next slide um, I do want to point out we had a, a registry that we do have an existing registry and this was really a platform as we envision for the future that that really this would be a platform that buyers and sellers could essentially come together and, and transactions could be completed through the registry and all the credits are tracked through the registry projects are entered in um, and then followed throughout the transaction process next slide um, and we we do rely on models to calculate those those nutrient reduction benefits. Uh, so we used the warmth model. Um, really, that was our attenuation model to understand what happens to nutrients once they enter the waterway. And we also used um, two other models that were really our infield models. So right now we're using utilizing the nutrient tracking tool, and previously we use it use the region five spreadsheet. So, you know, we're not using in-field or on-site monitoring or in-stream monitoring. We were relying on models to, to determine what our credit calculations were for the project. Uh, next slide. Um, and then, you know, I just really quickly wanted to recap that, uh, you know, we have a, uh, an, an equation whereby we determine, you know, what a, a credit is. And I also wanted to point out that, you know, the, the equation and the trading program are really designed to achieve overall water quality benefits in the watershed. It's not a one-to-one -one offset from a point source to a non-point source. And how do we do that? You know, we build in a, a safety factor. We have this margin of safety that to make sure, um, you know, that we're not underestimating the nutrient reductions and, and how that would relate to a permit. But also all 10% of all credits produced are retired right off, right off the top, um, right off the bat. Um, and we also have this bank uh, that uh, if, if a project were to fail, we can pull up on that bank to make sure we have enough credits in case a project would fail. And if there are no failures, then the credits in that bank are retired as well. So, so you know, it is really set up to get overall water quality improvements within the watershed, and we're just not offsetting a, a point source input one-to-one. -one. Uh, please advance. Uh, again, I'm, I'm getting a little short on time here, so I only have uh, about three or four slides left, and I want to make sure we get to those. So um, I, I now want to talk a little bit um, about how we're really trying to tweak um, the Ohio River Basin Trading Program and, and utilize it in, in a different way. So Mark did talk about how, you know, markets for trading are thin. Those regulatory drivers have really uh, never developed. 
Um, so how can we take the protocols and processes that we feel like we've proven in our pilot phase of the water quality trading program and implement those in another manner? Uh, and what we're trying to do is, is really work with the local community. In this case, um, it's the City of Columbus and other local communities and other, other um, potential corporate partners to initiate um, an ag municipal partnership and payment for ecosystem services program in central Ohio. Next slide. Uh, so hopefully we can, you know, um, address a concern. So, so nitrates in, in the upper Scioto River watershed have been a particular concern in central Ohio. Um, there have been periods in the past few years where nitrate levels um, in central Ohio ha that are used for drinking water have exceeded the 10 milligram per liter um, um, requirement uh, set by uh, EPA. Um, so can we achieve a 30% reduction in the Upper Scioto River watershed um, by implementing um, uh, not only a payment for ecosystem services project, but other, but other programs within the watershed um, that, that really prepare farmers and landowners for implementing soil health practices and also having modeling and monitoring um, activities in place so that any changes uh, that, that in water quality that do occur, we can attribute that to the practices that would be put in place through the PES program. Next slide. So I just quickly want to talk about four critical strategies in our project in the Upper Scioto River watershed. Uh, next slide. Uh, Mark mentioned really we're transitioning to this idea of soil health, and, and that's really um, key to our project in the Upper Scioto watershed. Actually, AFT is is has been uh, completing a series of case studies um, with farmers that are successfully implementing soil health practices, and we've been quantifying not only the economic benefits but the environmental benefits to successfully implementing those soil health. Uh, practices, and we've developed a series of case studies that prove that you know farmers can implement those practices here, that they work in this location and not just somewhere else. And next slide, we're able to use those case studies not only with farmers to convince additional farmers in the watershed to adopt those soil health practices, but we can also use them with landowners um, and educate landowners that rent out their farms to farmers. So, so that they can be educated about those practices and potentially be a part of the solution. Maybe have, you know, lend a helping hand in in helping, um, you know, have a role in investing in those practices at the ground level um, to help farmers overcome a, an economic barrier to implement those practices. Um, and then the 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 third next slide, please. Um, the third strategy is to capitalize a payment for environmental services fund that does protect drinking water. So, um, you know, focus on nitrate reductions, which is the pr principal concern in this watershed. Focus incentives at the farm level to achieve those uh, nitrate reductions. And then have assurances um, and, and proper justification for local municipalities or local corporations that would have a vested interest in having those um, outcomes achieved in the watershed be the primary investors um, in the fund that provide those incentives to the farmers. And again, we want to build on the best components of the ORB tra trading program. So have uh, you know have those um, you know those protocols, those documentation pieces in place, those assurances that those are reductions are being achieved. Uh, so, so that um, those those investors have those assurances and know that those reductions are actually being achieved. Um, next slide. And finally, you know, having appropriate monitoring in place. So again, you know, having upstream and downstream monitoring, in-stream monitoring, and before and after monitoring. So, it, so as practices go in, you know, we can attribute changes in water quality to the successful implementation of those practices. And then having ongoing modeling, so knowing where we need to make investments, what fields, what farms, what locations are, are you know, 
the most having the most input um, as far as nitrate inputs in the watershed. So so making sure those investments are going in at the right places. Uh, so that really is is encompasses my presentation and. And again, I know we're a little going to be a little short on uh, Q and A time, but uh, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity to to present uh, the information. All right, thank you so much, Brian. And there is American Farmland Trust website for everyone uh, to learn more. And just a couple quick resources uh, from ATRA. Uh, Dr. Bells and I have co-authored a publication on payments for ecosystem services, which is a great overview on you know. The different types available to farmers and ranchers. Um, the part one and part two of this webinar series, part one again being largely based off that publication with some more added in and part two was with Debbie Reed from Ecosystem Service Market Consortium and Jim Blackburn from Bryce University's Baker Institute on Carbon Markets and Credit Stacking. Both of those are on YouTube. Uh, you can find them there. And you know, thank you all very much and let's move. I know we had one question that was interested on y'all's, uh, wanted y'all to comment, both of you, on biochars, what role biochar could play in potential contribution to water quality. So Colin, this is Mark, I'm happy to uh, take a very quick crack at that. I think there, everything is on the table. What comes down to is what is the benefit that comes from that application of biochar and uh, that's kind of this mix of participation with agriculture is um, if there are practices that are being implemented in the landscape to uh, bring soil health uh, to the operation and those result in some kind of environmental benefit in terms of carbon sequestration water quality or water quantity uh, and they can be quantified those are those are practices that uh, would be accepted and probably in some programs but again the point of these programs is, is you have to pay for something uh, you have to pay for a tangible quantifiable benefit and so I, I would just say that hey if there's a measurable environmental benefit it can be part of these programs yeah and I would just second that um, in 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 really um, say that when when he's talking about measurable, you know, either there's science behind it, um, you know, that can you can justify kind of modeling that benefit, um, or you know, you have to have some type of actual monitoring in place um, that that can quantify that benefit as well. So either you have the science behind it, you, so you can model it, or actual monitoring uh, that occurs to to quantify those benefits. Okay, great. Thanks, all. And then let's sneak one more in before we get to the uh, one o'clock central time mark. And this one's for you, Brian. Could the Ohio River Basin or the Scioto Watershed Project be combined with another ecosystem service market, such as carbon uh, or wetland mitigation banking? Um, so the short answer is yes. Um, you know, we're developing the framework for the Upper Scioto Project. And, you know, part of the framework is is we want to be able to have the flexibility to to potentially be able to stack those benefits um, and and potentially have farmers in, incentivized from you know multiple sources, uh, whether it be you know um, entities interested in the water quality benefit or the carbon benefit, um, and that, that was something that was also tested tested um, in the Ohio River Basin Trading Program. Uh, so we evaluated that, um, and you can could do it through the Ohio River Basin Trading Program. If, if you're talking about, you know, uh, an actual formal trading program, the cost of that can be high as far as carbon, but it is something that can be done um, through a, a formalized trading program like the ORB trading program. Definitely. All right. Well, that's all we have time for. Um, any that we're left lingering, we will get to in the next couple of days. Um, thank you to uh, Mark Kaiser and Associates. Um, Brian Brandt and American Farmland Trust, uh, Dr. Bellows at Texas Institute for Applied Environmental Research, Southern Sarah, and of course, in Catanatra, and to everyone that attended. Uh, everyone have a great day, and thank you all. Thank you.